Christian Unity, a tract by C. W. Naylor. Is unity desirable? When we take a comprehensive survey of Christianity as a whole, many striking things are presented to our view, but none of them are more apparent nor more obviously singular than the fact of the disorganized state of the professed believers in Christ. The division and lack of cooperation so plainly visible everywhere cannot but impress all beholders as one of the greatest hindrances to the successful propagation of Christianity. The Christian world views this with regret. Christian people everywhere look back to the primitive days of the church and deep in their hearts long for the return of such conditions. They see the spectacle of many different kinds of Christians or Christians of many different brands. They see Presbyterian Christians, Methodist Christians, Baptist Christians, Brethren Christians, and hundreds of other different sorts. The world sees the same spectacle. The heathen looking up on it say, how many Christs are there? Non-Christians in Christian lands are asking as Paul asked of old, is Christ divided? Why should there be all these different kinds of Christians? Why is there so much division to be seen among those who profess to be followers of the same Lord? Why cannot all be content simply to be Christians without any name of division or without any spirit of division? Why cannot all join hands and hearts in the one work that lies close to all their hearts? Why must they be separated into parties? Would it not be far better if these distinctions were all abolished? Would not the uniting of all Christians be one of the most desirable of all things? The evils of disunion are so well known that they have but to be mentioned to be understood. The Christian Desire for Unity All true Christians feel in their hearts the stirring of a desire to see the restoration of primitive conditions. It is true that some of them may be strongly attached to the party to which they belong, but they find in their hearts also something that reaches out toward those who are their brethren, though they are in different bodies. There is in the Christian consciousness a feeling that all Christians should be one. They may see no way for the attainment of this unity, but nevertheless they desire it and are more and more seeing the need of it. The Holy Spirit is working in a special manner in these times to draw Christians to each other, and many of them are becoming impatient with the conditions that hold them apart. They are coming to see, more and more, and the world is coming to see, that if the church is to fulfill its mission in the world and save the world for Christ, and to overthrow the false religions and establish itself in their stead, some more effective means must be found. In the beginning of the 20th century, we behold the world largely pagan or Mohammedan. We see the church hampered on every side and hindered in all its efforts, and the chief hindrance is the lack of unity. Christ's Prayer Not only are Christians longing for unity, but the great founder of the church must be deeply grieved in his heart at the sight that prevailing conditions present. His attitude may easily be known by his teaching, and more especially by that wonderful prayer uttered on the night of his arrest. In that, he breathed forth the deepest longings of his heart. He was about to be separated from his people. He would walk with his disciples but little more. In a few days, they were to be left alone. His physical presence would be with them no more. They were to take up the burden he had borne. They were to carry forward the work that he laid down. And out of the deep love of his heart for them and for those who would hear his word and believe on him, he poured out his heart to the Father in earnest supplication for them. He did not pray that they might be great and have honor of men, that they might be rich and influential. He did not pray that they might have power and authority. But these are his words. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, 
John 17, 20 through 23. That was his heart's deepest desire. He had said to them before, All ye are brethren, and it was his earnest desire that the church that was to bear his name should in all the days to come be a true brotherhood and have the spirit of brotherhood. His desire is no less strong today. And if man would give him his way, all those things which cause division and separation between his people would be destroyed, and all their hearts would be drawn into tender bonds of love and sympathy and brotherly kindness. That would make the answer to his prayer visible. That would make its reality apparent to the world. The Reproach of Division There is no taunt that infidels and skeptics like better to throw into the faces of Christians than the reproach of division. On the mission field, there is nothing that hinders the work of God so much as division. The lack of cooperation, the duplication of work, the lack of harmony, so often apparent, the labor to build up parties, all this tends to create a barrier over which the heathen must pass before he reaches Christ. In the homeland, that barrier also stands between the sinner and Christ. He sees that Christianity in its teachings inculcates love, gentleness, meekness, kindness, forbearance, charity, mercy, and all like qualities. He sees that it condemns hatred, malice, envy, and all other things that produce division among Christians. But notwithstanding this teaching, he beholds the spectacle of a divided Christianity, which throws its dark shadow over the beautiful teachings of the gospel and has a strong tendency to make him believe that those teachings are merely an idealism that fails when an attempt is made to put it into actual practice. Unity Attainable Is there no remedy for prevailing conditions? Is there no means of meeting the situation and restoring the unity of the church? All evil conditions may be remedied by the application of means of a proper kind and of sufficient power. There is a remedy that is fully adequate. There are means which may be used and which, when properly used, will not fail. God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His power is not too limited to meet the need. The one thing necessary is that his people everywhere submit to him and permit him to apply that remedy to their own hearts. We dare not say that God cannot bring his people into unity. The only question is, will we permit him to do it? And when he offers a remedy, will we work with him conscientiously to apply that remedy in a manner that will render it effective? The differences between Christians are not such that they cannot be removed. They are not greater than the power of God. The question is not too intricate for him to solve. He will find a means. Will we use his means? Do we, as his people, desire unity to the extent that we are willing to sacrifice those things that stand in the way of that unity? In fact, unity cannot fail to exist unless Christians consent to those things which cause divisions. It is because they consent to being divided that they are divided. The day when they arise with full purpose of heart and say, we will be one, we will no longer be divided, they will find God's remedy for their division waiting its immediate application, and it will soon prove its efficacy. Division is not a necessary thing. No evil condition is necessary. When we, with God, set ourselves to remove it, he stands ready today to cooperate with us to the fullest extent in the restoration of the unity of his people. Nature of the Differences the chief differences between Christians are not things that lie deep. They are not things in the heart, but are, for the most part, externals. They are a wedge, the thicker part of which consists of external things, such as ecclesiastical forms, ceremonies, creeds, and methods. The less fundamental to spirituality these things are, the greater is their divisive force, and the harder they are to remove. Christians are closest to one another in the vital things, in those things in which they are nearest to God. In fact, the nearer they are to God, the nearer they are to one another in these vital things. If they are divided in fundamental spiritual essentials, the question is, are they Christians at all? 
we should distinguish between Christians in fact and Christians in name only. Those who are truly Christians have, dwelling in them, the life of God himself, and have in them those things that are fundamentally essential to unity. They have one God, one Lord, one Spirit, one common salvation, a common standard of life, the Bible, one hope, one work, one heaven. If they are not one in these things, they would not be worthy of the name of Christ. It is not on these lines that there is cleavage. It is when they come to the less fundamental and less vital things, those external manifestations of Christianity, and those things that have been added to it, that there is divergence. It is these added things that are no part of the heart of Christianity that separate Christians. The great ecclesiastical systems, with their laws and forms, with their inflexible creeds, and with their man-chosen methods, it is these things that have been grafted on to Christianity that hinder the spiritual life, that shut up the spirit within ecclesiastical walls, and that forbid his acting in that simple and natural way that he would act in the hearts of his people. These things do not unite people, but on the contrary, divide them and make partisans of them, and keep them interested in partisan things and occupied in building up, not Christianity in its broad sense, but the forms and ceremonies and parties to which they are attached. It is only when we make fundamental spirituals more important than these externals, it is only when we come to see the former as being all important, and when we come to detach importance from the externals, that unity becomes possible, or even a conception of unity becomes possible to us. These externals are no part of true Christianity. They are but the shell, dead, lifeless, formal, the work of men, while the real Christianity, the life and grace and power, the holiness and godliness, are from God. We should carefully distinguish between these two until the true religion of Christ stands out prominent by itself, separated in our consciousness from all these externals. Federation and why it would fail. For years there has been a strong current of sentiment in favor of the federation of the various Christian bodies. Many persons have been making earnest efforts to bring this about. Conferences and conventions have been held. Committees have labored long and earnestly, but in most cases, little has been accomplished beyond increasing the sentiment in favor of federation. There are, however, certain reasons, reasons which are fundamental, that make it certain that federation can never successfully establish unity. Whatever good may be accomplished by this method can only be partial and unsatisfactory. It can only end in failure. To succeed, anything must be established on right principles, and the principles upon which federation is based being in themselves fundamentally wrong, there is no probability that success can ever be achieved. It is working from the wrong end. As already shown, Christians are nearest in spiritual things and farthest apart in externals. Federation attempts to unite them and begins its work of uniting at that point where they are furthest separated. The attempt to unite on externals, such as church government, a creed, methods of working, and similar things, approaches the work from its least favorable angle. It is certain that we can never be successful by working along such lines. Christian unity is a spiritual thing. It will not begin on the outside and work inward. It must begin on the inside and thence proceed to externals. It must be first a union of hearts before it can be a union of hands. It must first be a union of ideals before it can be a union of methods. It must first have a common purpose before there can be unity of action. These things Federation does not supply and cannot supply. There is, therefore, no hope of Bible unity coming from federation. Organic unity can never be reached when it is the goal of our efforts. When we labor to establish it, we miss that upon which it depends. It is not a cause. It is an effect. It is not the tree. It is but the fruit. Its object is not real unity. It tries to unite all professors of Christianity not all Christians. 
It tries to unite them as bodies, not as individuals. In this, it is directly opposed to the only means whereby true unity can be established. Federation, at best, can be only a union of dissimilar parts. Scriptural unity is the uniting of all Christians. But as the various denominations are composed of a mixture of Christians and sinners, Federation can be no more than a great union of these two classes, and such union is vitally weak. It is fundamentally wrong. To try to unite the earnest, sincere, pious, holy, humble, meek, and loyal children of God with the worldly, vain, selfish, impure, and often thoroughly anti-Christian professors of the popular churches is like trying to mix oil and water. It can never be successful. Real unity is the unity of similar elements into a homogeneous whole. Such a whole can be made up only of true Christians, for true Christians and sinners can never be homogeneous. They are dissimilar elements and can never combine into a unity. So long as the object of federation is to unite all professors, with no distinction between the holy and the unholy, between the spiritual and the worldly, between those who are truly Christians and those who are such merely in form, whatever union may be affected cannot by any means be scriptural unity. Christians, and they alone, united on the fundamental spiritual basis of union with Christ, is the only form of unity that can ever be effective and such unity is not the object of federation. It makes no attempt to distinguish between the two classes. Its aim is to gather them all into one great organization. Whatever attempts may be made at a separation is a secondary, not the primary object, of those working for federation. In view of this fact, federation is not the thing for which God and his earnest people are looking nor will it ever accomplish the thing that they desire. The method of federation is counter to the real principles of unity. It attempts to affect by mechanical action what can be accomplished only by chemical means. Unity is not a mixing of dissimilar elements. It is not something that can be accomplished by mechanical action. An external uniting can never take the place of that internal union of souls necessary to scriptural unity. The tie and the only tie that can bind Christian hearts together is that spiritual affinity which is established by the indwelling Spirit of God, and this affinity can only exist between Christians. Therefore, since Federation can never supply this spiritual tie, and since its method has little, if any, influence to bring about favorable conditions for the creation of such a tie, it must of necessity fail to establish unity. Since the affinity of hearts through the action of the Spirit of God is the only thing that can lead to the uniting and holding together of the individual units, and since federation is the uniting of both saved and unsaved, it fails in this essential fundamental. This failure is vital. There is an obstacle in its way that its methods can never remove. Federation exalts human ecclesiasticism. Man rule has been the greatest hindrance to the progress of pure Christianity that the Protestant world has ever known. Federation increases this human ecclesiasticism. While it would join together bodies of religious people by adopting their ecclesiastical systems, it would make necessary the adoption of a superdenominational ecclesiastical system. The more such things are multiplied, and the more widely their influence is extended, the greater barrier they are to the return of that essential simplicity of church government and relation without which there can be no real unity. In the beginning, the church was simply a brotherhood. It had no dignitaries nor human-made laws. Each officer who guided God's people received his authority, not from man, but directly from God. Happy indeed would it have been for the world if human ecclesiasticism had never been, 
and real unity can never prevail without the re-establishment of that original simplicity of church government and relation that in apostolic times gave freedom to the Spirit of God to work as he did in every soul. The ecclesiastical systems of today are the greatest single barrier to unity, and the uniting of these systems can but create a still greater barrier. The idea that one man has power to confer authority upon another man to do the work of God, and that men have the right to legislate for the church and prescribe government and authority and forms is what divided the work of the Reformation and what has kept Protestants divided ever since, and it will keep them divided so long as they hold the idea and work accordingly. The only possible way to reestablish the unity of believers is to reject these humanly devised forms with all their complicated machinery and go back to the biblical idea of each church as an autonomous unit, independent in its own affairs, though closely united to other such churches by the strong tie of Christian brotherhood, with divinely chosen officers who follow God, not some human authority. This can never result from federation. Therefore, federation must fail. Federation requires the sacrifice of truth and the recognition of that which is false. If religious bodies hold strongly to their doctrines and hold to them as true, there can be no close federation with those who are of a different opinion. In order, therefore, that there may be federation, there must be a sacrifice of those doctrines that conflict with the doctrines of others, and in order to do this, truth itself must often be sacrificed. And where truth is sacrificed, that which is vital is lost. Any union that requires in its very nature the obscuring of any of the definite truths of the Bible must be wrong in principle, and therefore must always be weak and never able to meet the demands of the hour. Furthermore, federation requires the recognition of principles and doctrines that are false. It must at least tolerate them, for there are many conflicting principles now taught among the religious denominations. Some of these are right and some are wrong. Some are true and some are false. But the false will not readily be surrendered. So those who hold to truth must not only sacrifice in some measure the truth that they hold, but also recognize the false. Without this, there can be no federation. And with this, federation can never reach its goal. Federation must be either too loose to be effective or else tyrannical. People do not easily submit to a sacrifice of what they esteem to be their rights. Neither do denominations. Therefore, they are slow to convey authority to a federated ruling body, and a body that will be vested with such authority could hardly be trusted to exercise that authority, for the tendency is ever and always to increase the authority. To find a mean where this authority would be real, to find a mean where this authority would be real, be binding and effective, and at the same time give scope for the free development of the federated bodies is particularly difficult. Either it must be an authority that is largely in name only, or it must be a controlling power that rules in a more or less dictatorial way. This is one of the weak points of federation, and this sort of church government in no way resembles the spiritual ideal for the government of God's people, but is utterly at variance with it in every particular. It exalts man to the place of God, and no such means can ever be productive of that heart unity of which Christ and his apostles taught, and which is exemplified in the early church. Federation must accept men and movements as they are. When churches consider entering into federation, they naturally demand that they be accepted as they are. They are very slow to make changes, even when these changes are not vital in any respect. People are wedded to their forms and customs. They do not relish having anyone interfere with them. There are many religious bodies in the world that are not at all spiritual. Their doctrines and their practices are not in harmony with pure Christianity. But these movements and the individuals composing them must be accepted as they are if federation is to prevail. Individual rights as they are conceived must not be trampled upon. Hence, the federation must be broad enough to accept these movements and all their members, for these bodies will not purge themselves. They are too well satisfied as they are. 
Federation, therefore, must be too inclusive. If it is too exclusive, there can be no federation. If it is too inclusive, its quality will be such that it will be largely unchristian in its character. Federation, therefore, could not be successful were this alone its fundamental weakness, for this weakness of itself is fatal. Federation has always within itself the forces that tend to disillusion. The forces that have held Christians apart during past centuries are too strong and too well entrenched to be easily uprooted. The mere joining together by external bonds of these disunited bodies would not in any wise destroy these forces of separation. They might for a time remain quiescent, but they would be there as a leaven, and their influence would work no matter how quickly and would gradually undermine the forces holding the Federation together. Denominational bodies have always tended toward division, and those same tendencies would work and finally prevail in any Federation within which they might operate. Since it is not possible to banish them without working a revolution in the individuals in which they work, and as Federation would not work such a revolution, it would have in its own bosom the things that would surely work for its destruction. This alone is enough to show thoughtful people the impossibility of making a success of Federation. The chief trouble with Federation is that it nowhere touches fundamental principles. It is always dealing with secondary things, and for this very reason is foredoomed to failure. Ties of Federation can be no stronger than the power that forms them. This is a self-evident truth. Uniting in mass by formal vote can produce no stronger tie than the wills of those so united. This tie, therefore, depends for its strength upon the strength of the will for union of those entering the Federation. Anything that will weaken the will of any important portion will weaken the whole. This tie is not strong enough to meet serious difficulties when they come, and serious difficulties do come to every movement. The will for unity will be at flood tide when the uniting is done, assuming that it will be done. It will be brought to that flood tide by the agitation for unity. And while men's minds are strongly stirred by such agitation, the tie of union may be strong. But as surely as there is a decline in the enthusiasm awakened by the propaganda for union, there will be a weakening of the ties holding it together. When the first impulse is lost, there is nothing to supply the motive sufficiently to preserve that strong determination of will to be won. Federation, therefore, must suffer a gradual decline of potency. There will be a gradual disintegration of the parts. The will for unity, gradually losing its strength, will finally arrive at a point where it no longer can overcome the divisive forces that are at work within the Federation. From any standpoint, therefore, Federation is doomed to fail. It can never solve the problems of today. It may be an earnest effort to solve them, but since it is working from the wrong direction, since its object is not real unity but union, since its method is counter to the true principles of unity, since it exalts human ecclesiasticism and requires the sacrifice of truth and the recognition of the false, since it must accept men and movements as they come to it, and since it could not rid itself of the forces of dissolution that are already at work, we conclude that federation is not God's way of bringing his people into one. There must be some more efficient method. There must be something that will produce better results. There must be something that will bring Christians into more intimate contact, something that will bring their hearts together and unite them strongly in the fundamental things, something that will work outwardly from the heart, from the spiritual life, uniting Christians despite external differences, something that will overpower these differences, and something that will cause the Christian body to reject these externals that hinder unity and to come together on God's basis of unity, a unity that is fundamentally right because it is fundamentally spiritual and because it centers in Christ. Any unity that does not so center cannot be true Christian unity. Fundamental nature 
of true unity. We come now to consider one of the most important phases of this subject. It has already been intimated that true Christian unity can exist between Christians only. The union of Christians and non-Christians can never be scriptural unity. The very fact that true unity begins in the heart and works outwardly to externals proves that it must have a basis of spiritual experience in the heart. This can come only by the union of the individual soul with God. None but a Christian can have the true spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of unity. Therefore, no matter how good a person may be morally, and no matter how much of a profession of religion he has, if he has not this individual union with Christ, he lacks that which is vitally essential to Christian unity, that without which there can be no real unity. It is evident, therefore, that no true Christian unity can come from the uniting of the present religious bodies as they now exist. Such would be a union of the saved and the unsaved, a mixture of saints and sinners. It is true that in the early churches, some individuals who had not this union with Christ were temporarily recognized as members. But such a condition was always abnormal, and it was the constant effort of the Christian teachers to keep the congregations free from such individuals. The pales of the church then were carefully guarded. Such a thing as accepting into a congregation a person who had not been born again was not a common practice. In fact, formal church joining, such as is so common today, was unknown at that time. Every member standing was regulated by his spiritual experience so far as that could be determined. The pales of the church then did not separate merely between the professors of religion and non-professors, but between those who were united to Christ and those who were not so united. No body of people today are in a normal condition nor possess those spiritual characteristics necessary to Christian union who do not keep clear this distinction and enforce it upon their members, receiving only such as bring forth fruits of righteousness. The application of this principle to the churches of today would greatly reduce their membership. It will also greatly increase their spiritual quality, and they would then be worthy to be called the churches of God. Few pastors are bold enough and true enough, and few churches humble enough to have this rule apply to them with whatever results might follow. The desire today is for numbers, to make a good showing, to stand out before the world as a large body. Quality is sacrificed for quantity. This very thing, more than anything, is responsible for the low state of spirituality that exists in so many churches. They are little, if any, better than religious clubs. They possess so little of the spiritual element that it is lost in the worldliness and pride and formality that exist. Arise, ye sleeping churches. Arise, ye pastors. Draw the lines between the just and the unjust between the righteous and the wicked. Purge out the leaven of hypocrisy. Establish again the spiritual theocracy of God. Let the word be preached and the judgments of God be executed until sinners are afraid, until the unrighteous cannot stand in the congregation of God's people. When Zion hath purged herself from the strangers that are within her gates, then will God speak in her midst again. Then will his glory be revealed. Then Christian unity will be a thing to be viewed as practicable and attainable, for the very elements that go farthest to establish it will be established in the churches. Before there can be Christian unity outwardly, there must be that inner renovation of our hearts that makes its existence possible. Only hearts filled with the divine spirit can flow together and be united together by those ties which are stronger than death, and which will hold through all life's adversities. Its tie is spiritual. In Ephesians 4, 3, we are told that Christian unity is the unity of the Spirit. That is, that it is the fruit of the working of the Spirit of God in the hearts of His people. It is therefore not something that can be established by agreeing to unite 
or by the votes of conferences and synods. It is something that must be wrought in the individual heart and life by the Spirit of God. The tie of Christian love is the tie that binds God's people together, Colossians 2 and 2, 3 and 14. It is the strongest tie that is known. It held the early Christians in unity through all the vicissitudes of the pagan persecutions. It was said, Behold how these Christians love each other. In 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 25, we are told that God hath tempered the body together, that there should be no schism, division in the body. The thing that prevents division then is that tempering that God does in the hearts. It is not, therefore, in the power of man to produce Christian unity, nor to produce the tie that holds Christians together. This tie can bind only Christian hearts. From this love, itself divinely implanted, comes that spiritual fellowship which is so sweet to those who dwell together in unity. It is life power. All Christians have a common life, Christ dwelling in them. This life power can be in none but the regenerated. Those quasi-Christians who reject the deity of Christ, his work, and his teachings, and still call themselves by his name, are unworthy to be included in any classification of Christians. The same is true of those worldlings with proud hearts, the covetous, revelers, and similar characters. They are no more a part of the Christian system then the dust that arises on the passage of an automobile is a part of the automobile, or the spray from the bow of a vessel is part of the vessel. They have only been temporarily displaced from among other worldlings by the momentum of Christianity. These can never have any part in Christian unity until they turn from their sinful ways and accept Jesus Christ and receive his life and become his followers indeed. We must recognize these natural ties and not try to substitute artificial ones. Ties that have their origin in natural things, such as social ties or the ties that come through ecclesiastical organizations or through the will of man to unite, can never be successfully substituted for those spiritual ties that have their source in God. All efforts towards substitution must inevitably fail. This is the reason that so many efforts to establish unity have been fruitless and why similar efforts in the future will be fruitless. The people in the great movements toward the unification of God's people may labor ever so diligently and with ever so good purposes, but their efforts can never result in real unity until they recognize the fact that they must begin with that innermost secret heart life and work outwardly from that. Any scheme for Christian unity that does not recognize this fact and act upon it has no chance whatever to succeed. It is a personal, not a collective thing. We have now come to the most important phase of true unity. The efforts that are being made in general view Christian unity in the light of a collective thing, a something that can be reached in mass. Such, however, it is not and cannot be. Having its beginning in the heart, it must, of necessity, be strictly personal in its origin. Each atom of a body must possess its own chemical affinity or attraction for every other part of the body. So the body of Christians must be made up of persons who, in themselves, possess the spiritual affinity necessary to unite them to others. The collective phase of Christian unity is the fruit of personal attainment of the Spirit, an attitude of unity. There is no difficulty to establish unity in external things between those who possess the spirit of unity in their hearts and that attitude of unity in which all Christians should abide. It is necessary only that they should understand each other and recognize in each other the spirit and attitude of unity. These produce a love of unity, and that love of unity will find its outward expression in collective unity among those who possess it. Division is a personal thing. Were there no divisions in the hearts of God's people, if they did not hold a partisan attitude and have a partisan love, parties could not exist. For the Spirit of Christ, dwelling in the heart, draws the people of God away from partisanship, away from division, and the things that cause it. 
There can be collective division only where there is personal division. The remedy, therefore, for collective division is the elimination of the spirit and attitude of division from the individual heart and life. If all professing Christians really desire to be one and were willing to make those sacrifices and take those steps necessary to affect unity, there is no power that could prevent its establishment. But so long as it is looked forward to as a thing of the distant future, and so long as it is considered in its collective instead of its personal aspect, so long division will rule. Christian love knows no boundaries save those that separate Christians and sinners, the wall of salvation. But as long as there are a we and a you in the individual consciousness, there is a denominational and a partisan element. Unity is a universal we, an all-inclusive solidarity, an undivided whole. The personal attitude of unity is the outreaching of Christian love and Christian fellowship to each individual Christian in the world, claiming him as a brother, regardless of what name he may bear, of his race or color, or of his association. The attitude of unity is all-embracing. It knows no division walls. It knows no party names. It knows no man for what he is or is not if he be but a Christian. Social ties may temporarily bind us to those with whom we associate most, but spiritual ties bind us alike to all Christians. Any ties that bind us in a partisan way are partisan ties and are subversive of true unity. True unity and partisanship are wholly incompatible. A unity that leaves us in a partisan relation and with a partisan sympathy can never be real unity. And the person who has a partisan relation and holds to it and who has a partisan sympathy has within him elements that shut him out from the true unity of the people of God. No person can ever be in the state of unity so long as he loves ecclesiastical forms, ceremonies, creeds, or any sectarian thing that it is dearer to him than the unity of believers. This latter must be first and foremost always. In true unity, there is no difference. Partisan distinctions fade away. All who possess the Christ life are bound one to another. They are not bound to a movement or to a party, but to all who are Christ's. Christ gives a concise definition of unity in John 17, 22 through 23. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me. This is the fundamental nature of true unity. Christ in us, working out through us in love and Christian charity, making us true brethren in his grace, united by the ties begotten by his spirit. The fundamental basis of unity. The basis of unity is twofold in its nature. Unity of the spirit or that inner experience common to all true believers and the unity of the faith, or the doctrine of Christ. Unity of the Spirit has already been spoken of as that personal work which is wrought in believers by the Holy Spirit, whereby the spirit and attitude of unity are established in their hearts. This is the vital thing in any consideration of the subject of unity, and it is useless to try to establish Christian unity on any other basis. Resolutions adopted, laws passed, organizations formed, creeds made, none of these can in any wise be a basis for Christian unity. Spiritual life, and that alone, is its fundamental basis. There must, however, be a basis of faith for Christians, and this basis of faith must be of such a nature that all Christians can accept it. It must therefore be fundamental in its nature and embody only such things as are really fundamental. The human mind is so constituted that all do not arrive at the same conclusion from a view of the same truths. Uniformity of faith, therefore, is not possible. Consequently, no systematic creed can ever be the basis of Christian unity. Certain faith, however, is essential to salvation and to the maintenance of Christian life. Without belief in those cardinal doctrines of Christian truth upon which salvation depends, the rejection of which prevents the entrance into spiritual relations with Christ 
and the maintenance of Christian life, one cannot be a Christian. Therefore, it is essential and absolutely vital that these truths be received, believed, and made the basis of individual faith. And those who reject these basic truths should not be accepted as Christians, for they cannot be such. These fundamental truths are vital and form the true basis of the unity of faith. Belief of these must be demanded also. To demand anything less is to be false to the Christian faith. When we amplify these, however, and require people to believe in a systematic creed, we at once usurp the power that does not belong rightfully to man. Other things are important. They have a great influence upon the Christian life and conduct, and truth ought always be received and believed. But as before stated, the human mind is so constituted that all do not arrive at the same conclusion from views of the same truth. There must be, therefore, full liberty of thought and opinion outside of those fundamentals. This does not imply that all truth should not be taught and earnest efforts be made to discard all errors, for such should always be our endeavor. But nothing besides the vital fundamentals should be made a test of fellowship, and the individual mind should not be bound by the minds of others, but left free to seek truth for itself. Differences of views, even on important, though not vital, matters, are no cause of division in themselves. Neither will they ever cause division unless they become controverted. As soon as controversy arises over them, they become dangerous, or rather, the controversy becomes dangerous, because it reacts upon the spiritual basis of unity and tends strongly to produce division of spirit. If we set up a theoretical standard covering what we esteem to be their range of truth and insist that all men believe that as we do and refuse to give them recognition because they do not believe as we do, we set up a sectarian standard and become partisans and try to exercise an unwarranted control over the faith of our brethren. We may teach them, but it is not lawful for us to try to compel them to accept what we teach. An honest man will accept everything that he sees to be truth, but no man should receive a thing as truth until he can understand that it is truth or be satisfied in his spirit that it is worthy to be received as truth. How can unity be attained and maintained? Such unity is personal in its nature. The first step is to receive the spirit of unity, the personal experience of being united with Christ. Then, if we are properly enlightened so that we understand that it is our duty to receive and accept every Christian on the basis of his relation with Christ alone, we can easily hold an attitude of unity toward all those who are saved. We should not hold this attitude toward only a part of those who are Christ's, for this is the partisan attitude, but our attitude should be all-embracing. The only question we should ask is, do they belong to Christ? If so, we should recognize the fact that there exists in their hearts and ours the spiritual basis of Christian unity. We have only to act out this in order to establish the actual and practical workings of Christian unity in its personal phase. Those who have this experience and hold the proper attitude toward each other find themselves drawn together by mutual ties and naturally desire to meet and worship together. Hearts that are attuned to each other demand union and ignore denominational lines. These lines can be obliterated by nothing else than divine love, and those who are trying to break them down by other means will do well to give heed to this fact, lest they be found to labor in vain. True unity is not interdenominational in character. It is and must be superdenominational. There lies before us, according to the prophecies, a time when Christianity will prosper and exhibit its power to a degree that has been unknown since apostolic times. There is to be a restoration of the church to that single, primitive form in which it first existed. There is again to be a true brotherhood. This can be brought about only by the rejection of human ecclesiasticism and of all partisanship, first by the individual, then by the cooperation of these individuals. 
the worship of God must be taken out of its formality and must be a thing of spirit and truth. It is not enough that we talk about unity and labor for it. We must have it in, within our hearts. And when we have it within our hearts, it will break down every sectarian barrier if it is permitted. God has but one church. He built but one. He will build no other. All who are born of the Spirit are members of that church. He has said there should be one fold and one shepherd. Let us then reject everything else than this divine relationship. Let us reject all the walls of separation that have been erected. Let us cultivate in our hearts that broad charity that embraces all who are in the love of Christ. Let us pray the prayer, God, make me so broad in my charity that I shall accept all whom thou dost accept. Make me so narrow that I shall shut out and reject all that which thou dost shut out and reject. Unity is maintained by keeping the spirit of unity and holding fast the unity of faith and avoiding controversy. These three things make unity safe when once established. Responsibility for division. As already stated, division is a personal thing. It is true that we as individuals cannot remove all divisions between Christians. That is quite beyond our power. There is a certain amount of it, however, for which each is responsible, and that is whatever amount may exist in himself. Each is responsible for himself and for his conduct, for his inner and his outer life and influence. Therefore, if I am partisan, if I hold fast to any divisive principle or permit any divisive spirit or attitude or principle to be in my heart, I am thus far a sectarian. I am personally responsible for all that division that is in my own heart or that is manifested in the relations of my life. Therefore, if I tolerate in my heart division, God will hold me, not others, responsible for that. He demands of me that I submit myself to him and that I seek with all my strength to be free from every element of division and that I seek the operation of his spirit upon my soul and through my life until division shall have no place therein. I cannot wait until others take this position, for they may never do so. I cannot wait for a general movement in this direction. God will hold me responsible if I do. You and I, my brother and sister, must see to it that we accept the basis of unity that God has provided and that we have in our souls the spirit of unity and that we manifest outwardly and to all God's children without distinction that attitude of brotherly affection and acknowledgement that God would have us manifest. There can be no excuse for neglect of this. Division is hateful to God. It is hindering his work. It is shutting souls out of heaven. If we have sectarian walls around us, around our own hearts, shutting us in from our brethren, damming up the streams of Christian charity, let us never rest for a single moment until they are broken down and until everyone who is Christ's has an equal place in our spiritual affections. God is working by his Holy Spirit at this time, according to prophecy and according to observation, to restore his people and bring them again into the unity of the Spirit, to fill them with the glory of his power, to make them a praise in the earth, and he will lead them into the truth and reveal duty if they will but follow after him. He will work out his will in us all. And if we submit ourselves to him and be willing to work for him through us according to his good pleasure, we shall have a part in the reestablishment of that holy and united brotherhood in which he will live and reign and through which he will exalt his name and proclaim the message of salvation to a lost world.